Welcome home, Compass Church family. We love being a church family together with you. And whether you've been with us before or you're new with us, connect with us. Maybe you're on one of our live services right now. We would love to chat with you. We'd love to get a prayer request from you. We've got connection cards available. Many people love to give to the mission of the Compass Church, and thank you for that. And if you missed it, last weekend our senior pastor stopped our teaching series to give a special message called Agents of Reconciliation. We'd love for you to go back and catch that message if you didn't already. You know, we've been in some hard and heavy days here just in the past three weeks. Two weeks ago, I was talking with my friend David. He's the senior pastor of a sister church of ours on the south side of Chicago. And David was telling me growing up in the 80s how his dad felt compelled to sit him down and walk him through what to do were he to get pulled over, just knowing many of the tensions that are in our society. And David was sharing with me that 30 years later, he felt compelled to sit his two boys down and share the same thoughts with them, just knowing that many of the tensions still exist. Do you know that God talks about how these generational sins can cycle in a society or in our own hearts? In fact, in the Old Testament, when God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses, he says, look, the ramifications of sin in a society or in a heart, they can go on to the third or the fourth generation. But then God, in the very next line, he says this, but I want to love those who love me to the thousandth generation. He says, I want to give my love to the thousandth generation to those who love and follow my commands. Friends, God is a God of hope. And I hope that you feel the presence of our God of hope in your life in these past three weeks. You know, a couple years ago, I was at a, a home decor store with my wife and I found this little treasure. I keep this small globe on my desk at my office just to remind me that God's got the whole world in his hands. You know, we're approaching the 100th year anniversary of that black spiritual song that came out of North Carolina. And the lyrics go on to say, he's got you and me, brother, in his hands. That reflects a biblical thought. You know, in the Bible, it says in Job that God has the breath of all of mankind in his hands. In his hands is the breath of all of mankind. Friends, God loves you, he cares for you, and he's got your and my breath in his hands. Let's pray to him together now. I would love to lead you in a prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the richness of your care. Just all of the heavy emotion of these past weeks has just had us needing to know that you've got the world in your hands, that you've got my world in your hands. And so Lord, we, we call out to you. You are a God of hope. You are a God of love out to the thousandth generation. Help us to follow you. Help me to love you more so that more love you. We pray this in your exalted and relevant name. Amen. You make a way when I cannot see you are my strength.
God, we're so grateful that you are our shield, that you protect us. We pray that, that as we go throughout today, that, that you would just continue to intercede for us. Continue to step in in this season. Strengthen us. Give us courage to face each day. And help us to hope and trust in you more. I pray this all in your loving and your mighty name. Amen. Today, we're in a tower on top of the Acropolis. The Acropolis is a large hill within the city walls of the town of Philippi. And up on top of it is this four-story Byzantine defense tower. It was built back in 700 AD. It's really quite an amazing structure. The entrance to the tower, the front door, is five feet off the ground. One more way to make it difficult for the enemy to get in. There's a spiral staircase that's still in quite good shape today as it rises up from floor to floor. And up at the very top, soldiers kept watch 24-7, scanning the horizon, and from that vantage point they could see for miles and miles away. Their objective was to spot the enemy army before they got very close. When they were spotted, word would be sent to the townspeople and they would rush within the city walls, lock and bar the doors and prepare for battle. The people of Philippi knew that the enemy were there and that they were coming. Unfortunately, Philippi was attacked many times throughout their history and they found that when they were warned ahead of time, when they were ready, they could win. When they were caught off guard, they would often lose. I wish that this story had little application to our lives, but unfortunately that's not the case. We have a very real enemy and he's coming. The Bible is painfully clear that Satan and his demons are committed to attack and destroy our lives. Fallen angels who God created, but they live in rebellion against him and they fight against God and his children. But the good news is that one of the subtle activities of God, one of those tremors, is that God will fight for us. In the invisible realm of our soul and mind where Satan seeks to destroy us, God promises to show up and defeat Satan for those who look to him. Now, if we're naive, if we don't know we're under attack, if we don't see Satan coming, if we don't recognize his advances, and if we fail to look to God, we're on our own, and the results can be disastrous. But if we're vigilant, if we're looking for Satan and seeing what he's doing, and when we recognize his efforts, if we cling to God in prayer, the Lord will meet us. He will strengthen us and fight for us. And through God's strength, every time, his children will win the day. This place is kind of creepy. This is a rock-cut pagan temple here in Philippi. You see those niches carved right into the rock wall? They would place idols in those niches, and the people would come to worship the idols. They would bring a sacrifice and lay it on these rock benches here. Maybe that doesn't bug you. Maybe you say, okay, so they were a little messed up. They were worshiping statues. Is that the end of the world? 
Well, actually, it's a big problem. Paul helps us understand what's really going on here when in 1 Corinthians 10.20, he said this. He said, when a sacrifice is being offered to an idol, like happens here, it is actually being offered to a demon, a fallen angel. Paul clarifies that what, what went on in this spot was demonic worship, Satanism, people pouring out their allegiance and affection to fallen angels. Very scary. Philippi was a place rich with demonic activity. And knowing that about Philippi, we're not surprised then when we turn to our passage and find a reference to a demon. Let's turn. We're studying now in Acts 16, verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. This verse says that this girl had a spirit, word spirit, uh, is actually python spirit. In the Greek, you see that it's a specific type of spirit, a python spirit, python being a snake. That translation is not given to us because to the modern reader, python spirit is kind of a meaningless reference. But in the ancient days, in Paul's day, they knew what a python spirit was. First of all, it was an evil spirit. And secondly, it was a particular type of spirit known for having the capacity to interpret the future, to provide guidance to the individual. In fact, there was a very famous woman possessed by a python spirit. She was called the Oracle of Delphi. Delphi is another city here in Greece, and she was very famous. People would travel from distant lands to get their fortune told by the Oracle at Delphi. And it's really interesting. We have a number of ancient visitors who journaled what their trip to the Oracle was like. And it gives us a better understanding of what interaction with this girl here in Philippi may have been like. Can I describe it to you? The visitors say that they entered a rock-cut temple, just like this one here. And they found the Oracle sitting on a stool in the middle of that temple. They said that she was clearly in an altered state. She was clearly possessed and not in her right mind. They would approach her with fear, appropriately so, and they would ask her for advice regarding their situation. The visitors described, though a woman, she spoke with the voice of a man. There was a low, raspy, groveling voice, terrifying to those who came that would speak offering this piece of wisdom. The demon was talking through this woman. Folks, that must have been what it was like to come to this young slave girl in Philippi. Similarly, she could predict the future, and a slave owner was making a lot of money with this girl through this practice. This slave girl is about to encounter the power of God through the Apostle Paul. So let's continue to see what happens next in verse 17. This girl, that, that's the demon-possessed girl, this girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. What in the world is going on here? Why, why would the demons want to proclaim the glorious truth about who Paul is and his mission of bringing salvation? It seems like the enemy is working for God. Friends, what we see here is a dynamic that occurs many times in the scriptures. In fact, four times in the Gospels, Jesus encounters demon-possessed people, and every time those demon-possessed people shout, you are the son of the Most High God. Well, why are they shouting this? There seems to be this impulsive need for the demon-possessed people to vocalize what they know. It's, it's as if they are intimidated or overwhelmed by the superior power and authority of God. You're the great and almighty God. It's like they've got to say it. 
It reminds me of when I was a kid. Uh, when I was a small child, my friends and I would, we would taunt the bigger kids on our street. In fact, we had a song we used to sing to them. We'd stand at a distance from the big kids and we'd say, hey, big kids, come and get us, or are you too chicken? What a song, huh? Well, we'd take off running and inevitably they would chase us, they would catch us, they would tackle us, they'd take, I remember, handfuls of grass and rub it in our face, and then they'd wrap their big arms around our chest and they would squeeze so tight until we cried uncle. They would demand more. Say who's the strongest. All right, you're the strongest. I admit you're the strongest. It's that kind of thing. It's this complete overwhelming of, of God in the presence of the demonic where they just say, uncle, I admit you're great. You're the most high God. It's like the Lord forces them to verbalize who he is. The demonic seem to be forced to submit to God to a degree. Yes, they're rebelling, but his power and authority is so great when they're in his presence, they've got to do what he wants them to do. We see this forced submission uh, in the book of Job. Job's a fascinating study of how God interacts with the demonic and how the demonic interact with us. In the book of Job from the Old Testament, Satan comes to God and says, I want to attack Job, but you've got this hedge of protection around him, preventing me from getting to him. Satan goes on to say, you think, God, you think Job loves you? He only loves you because he's got a charmed life. You've blessed him so much. Satan says, God, if you allowed me to take away his blessings, he'd turn on you and curse you to your face. God says, you think so, huh? Let's try it. And God says, here's what I allow. I will allow you to take away his material possessions, but you can't harm his body. Uh, it's real interesting. We see that here the, the demonic are submitting to the authority of God, only doing what God gives them permission to do. We see that God's got a hedge of protection. Friends, if you're terrified of the demonic, don't be. Sometimes Christians get so wigged out, they're like laying in bed trembling, going, some demonic monster is going to come and get me. Friends, don't worry. Jesus says that he who is in you, that's the Spirit of God, is so much greater than he who is in the world. That's referring to the demonic. And so we can rest at night knowing that there's a hedge of protection, that God has his own, and he's saying, no, you can't go here. And when the demonic are allowed to come in and tempt us or discourage us, God's allowing it. With his infinite love and wisdom, he's allowing some of, a, some of that confrontation. But we have no need to be paranoid. Is there a war? Yes. Should we be terrified? No. Because this demonic submit to the great power of God, and God protects us. So relax, you're in good hands. It's one of the things I see here, but there's more. In fact, when I look closely, I begin to see the tactics that Satan utilizes in his attack. I, I wanted to highlight a phrase. It said, this girl followed Paul and the rest of us. She followed them. You know, the word following in the New Testament is very significant. It points to discipleship. You know, the disciples followed Jesus. There was this sense of, I want to join you. And when this girl starts to follow the Christians, it's pointing to her acting as if she wants to be part of them. She wants to be included in the club, the Christian church. Why would Satan want to do that? Friends, the enemy is infiltrating the people of God. I'm assuming this is what happened. Satan realized, I can't stop her from proclaiming the truth, that these guys are servants of God and that they're proclaiming the way to be saved. If I can't stop her from proclaiming that, I will use her proclamation of that to make it look like she's a good guy, one of them. He's 
trying to make her look like an agent of light, even though she's secretly an agent of darkness. This is how Satan rolls. He is deceptive at his core. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that Satan disguises himself as an angel of the light. He's trying to come across as innocent, as good, even though he's not. John 8, points to the deception as well. It says, when Satan lies, he's speaking his native language. He's like the father of lies. This is how he rolls. So acting innocent and good when he's not, this is very much characteristic of the tactics of Satan. He tries to deceive. He will try to get you and I to think something's a good idea. Something's satisfying. Something's wonderful. When the truth is, it's horrible. I, I saw this uh, just this week, actually. I was visiting my parents in Lake Geneva, and as I was down walking by the lake, I bumped into a lady who lives on the lake there, and she and I got into a conversation. She said, I just arrived here uh, yesterday. She said, we left our house in Florida, and we flew in my husband's jet, and we arrived at our house here on the lake, and it felt so good to come into our home. Our property manager had it all prepared for us. It was beautiful. And as I left that conversation, I just started thinking, man, what would it be like to be that rich? I mean, to have a private jet bringing you all over the nation from one of your houses to the other of your houses and to have property managers that take care of everything for you. I was fantasizing about that. I was growing discontent with my lot in life as I did so. And then all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm buying a lie. I'm buying the lie that I would be deliriously happy if I was filthy rich. I'm buying the lie that my soul would find satisfaction if I had a property manager, a private jet, a couple of homes. And I stood up in that moment and spoke the truth. I said, Satan, I've bought this lie before, and I'm not going to fall for it again. I know, I've met enough miserable rich people to know that the human being was not made to find soul satisfaction in the things of this world. I was meant to find life and joy in relationship with Jesus Christ, basking in his love. Stuff is not where it's at. I called out the lie and refused to walk in it. Be aware of Satan's deception, making you think that this would be a great idea. Do this, get that. He lies, that's what he does. So that's one of his tactics, deception. And the second is destruction. Satan loves to destroy. To destroy lives like yours, to destroy churches like ours. He wants to destroy whatever God is doing. And we see this back in verse 18, where it says, she kept this up for many days. Why does she keep on calling out this same statement over and over again for many days? Satan's got a unique strategy here. He, he realizes that if he can make it look like she's one of them, and make her uh, mental instability abundantly known, it will smear the reputation of the church. And sure enough, that's what started to happen. Paul started to get annoyed and realize, boy, this is not good. This, at first, Paul may have thought this was free publicity. But now he's starting to say, we're looking like crazy people. She's got to stop this. Satan is trying to hinder that church, that new church in Philippi. And friends, the strategy to destroy is, is an expression of what he does. He destroys. Jesus mentioned this in John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief, that's Satan, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. It goes on. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And so be aware that Satan is looking for ways to destroy your life. I was reminded of Satan's destructive intent in my life in a letter I received 
from a dear friend. Uh, Dr. Lyle Dorset is a professor that I had back in school, taught me Bible theology, and he has been a mentor in my life for a long time, and he writes me letters occasionally, and one that I got, uh, it was a real nice letter. It's going on about all the things that he wanted to encourage me with, but it took a, a subtle and unexpected shift. Dr. Dorset says, Jeff, keep your eye on the Lord. Pray to remain humble. I pray regularly for your protection. Wow, he thinks I need to be protected? And he continues, the evil one hates you and all that you stand for and all that you do. I didn't see that coming. I, to be reminded that the, the evil one just hates my guts that he just can't stand me, our church, what we're doing, and that he's after us. That was a sobering reminder that I needed to have. Friends, it's true. Though there's a hedge of protection, know this, Satan is determined to use deception and destruction to get at our lives. And the question then is, well, what do we do? If his tactics are deception and destruction, what are our tactics to fight against what he's getting at? And thankfully, the Apostle Paul provides us great guidance on what we too should do. So let's look at verse 18. It says, finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and he said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Friends, what a powerful confrontation of light against darkness. The Apostle Paul wheels around and in the name of Jesus Christ gets rid of this demon. I see in Paul's activity here two tactics that we too should employ. The first is discern and the second turn. Discern Satan's attack and turn to Jesus. When I say discern, there was a point where Paul realized what Satan was trying to do. At first, he may have said, oh, I think it's kind of cool that this woman is proclaiming that we're bringing the way of salvation. But as it went on for days, all of a sudden, Paul was like, oh, I get it. You're making us look crazy. And the minute Paul realized what Satan was up to, after he discerned, he turned and the power of Jesus. This is real important. When he casts out the demonic, he does it in the name of Jesus. This is very different from how Jesus cast out demons. When Jesus cast out demons, he just said, go. But when Paul does, he realizes, I don't have the power in and of myself like Jesus did to tell him to go. I have to attack in the power of Christ. With Jesus, it is direct power. With Paul, it's derived power. It's another's power through him. It's in the name of Jesus that he has the power to win the day. And that's what we must do. If we, want, if we turn to fight against the demonic on our own, we'll, we'll lose. But if we turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I need your help in this moment against this enemy, we'll win every time. In fact, James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you every time. You want to get rid of them? Turn to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, in your power, get this tempter out of my mind and life right now. Uh, friends, these uh, two simple tactics are so helpful. If you've got an area of discouragement in your life or fear or failure, you, what you want to do is discern. Say, Lord, help me figure out what's going on here. Why am I struggling? Is this demonic, God? Is Satan trying to deceive me or get me to believe something? And the Holy Spirit can help you discern if and what the enemy is trying to do in your mind in that moment. And when you gain some clarity of what he's up to, then you turn to Jesus and you say, Lord, simple prayer, get him out of here. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I need your power to deliver me from this attack and he will flee from you, as is promised in James. Every time, he'll flee. Friends, there's good news. We don't have to freak out about this spiritual warfare 
that we are in. We can discern what the enemy's up to with the help of the Spirit. We can pray to Jesus and be freed of that temptation. And the struggle may go on at that point, but it's us in our own flesh uh, getting helped by the Spirit. But when we want freedom from the demonic attack, we'll get freedom if we turn to the Lord. You know, I'll, I'll share an example of my own life, an area that I've had frequent spiritual attack. And to tell you about it, we need to go back to Philippi. We're back at the basilica that collapsed with the earthquake. And I want to show you a really interesting detail. This is the pulpit that the preacher would preach from. It's a 1,500-year-old pulpit. Can you believe that? And look at the, the fine white marble that used to encase the pulpit in its entirety. In the ancient basilica, the, the preacher would climb up these steps and preach from up high to the people gathered all around them in this basilica. And I can tell you something about this place. This is a spot of demonic attack. You say, Jeff, how do you know that? I know that from personal experience. In the early days of my preaching ministry, I'd be about halfway through my sermon, and a thought would enter my mind with amazing clarity. The thought was this. This is the worst sermon in the history of the world. Followed by this thought. You are the worst preacher in the history of the world. These thoughts would just echo through my mind and end up taking away the power, the confidence, the effectiveness of the rest of my sermon. Well, I've learned a bit, and I now know that those thoughts come from Satan himself. I'm under demonic attack in those moments. And I'm able to discern that that's Satan I'm fighting against, and I'm able to turn to Jesus. In the middle of my sermon, when I'm struggling with discouragement in that way, I will silently pray, Jesus, help, help, get rid of this voice. And, and Jesus does. Every time I am freed, he, he comes to my rescue. The tremor of divine activity fighting for me releases me from the discouragement, and I'm able to finish with power and confidence and effectiveness. You know, it's fun when Satan has to whimper and go home in defeat. And folks, you can know that every time through Jesus Christ, you can have victory when Satan attacks.
Bye.
Friends, our prayer is that you have felt surrounded today by the love of God. You know, I was talking with one of our elders just this week. He was telling me about a new couple that joined his small group this week. Yeah, they found the Compass Church just in the past two months online, reached out to us with a connection card. We reached back to them. They got plugged into a group and they showed up to the group this week, meeting some new friends. They even came to the prayer gathering that we had at our South Naperville campus this last weekend. Uh, friends, you can get plugged into our church family too. Let us know that you're out there. We would love to be a church family for you. We would love to say, welcome home. And join us next weekend. We're gonna continue on with this teaching series, Tremors, the subtle activity of God. We're gonna see how God strengthens and encourages us. Love to have you there. God bless you.